and we are live. Hi everyone, welcome to Startout's second annual Equity Summit. Thank you for attending this exciting panel discussion on how to navigate a tech startup as a non-technical founder. Before I hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves, my name is Jules Allen and I'll be moderating this discussion today. To give you a little background, I'm an SEO director at IEMA. We are a global digital marketing agency specializing in search engine optimization. I work with startups and companies of all sizes to ensure that organic search is prioritized in any sort of website project. So whether we're launching a brand new site for our client or we're migrating from one platform to another, we're working with designers, developers, and even stakeholders to ensure that organic search is prioritized throughout that entire project. So that brings me to our brilliant founders that we'll be having a conversation with today. I'll let them introduce themselves and tell the audience a little bit about their background. Avita, I'll start with you. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, my name is Evita Grant. Um, I'm originally from Ghana, and my team and I are building a cross-border payment platform for SMEs that engage in US Africa trade and commerce. I'm glad to be here and share with you all the knowledge that I've gained in the many in the years that I've been building my platform as a non-technical founder. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Jules and Avita, and um, great to be here. My name is Arthur Woods. I'm uh, one of the co-founders at a company called Matheson. Um, we are a diversity recruiting technology, so we help companies uh, basically cast a wider net in the way that they hire and reduce bias in their hiring process so that uh, they can build uh, more equitable and inclusive workplaces. So we started the company about two and a half years ago. We've been growing quickly and um, it's been a blast as a technical, as a non-technical uh, co-founder in this case. Um, and, you know, before that, uh, I actually had a chance to uh, co-found an organization called Out in Tech, um, and I've been in the HR tech space for years and years. So we're really excited to, to be here for this conversation. Awesome. Thank you both for joining. I just want to remind everyone that we will have a Q&A session at the end of our discussion. So if you have any questions that weren't covered during the panel, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat. So to start this conversation, Plenty of people have ideas, but they don't really have the technical expertise to bring them to fruition. So were you, were either of you overwhelmed in that process or how did that process begin for both of you? Evie, do you wanna go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I think it was very overwhelming because usually the first question is where do I start? Like what is the first step that I need to take? And um, looking back, I think what I ended up doing was just talking to a lot of other founders to figure out what was their first starting point. And then also trying to talk to other engineers to see if I might be able to find a technical co-founder. But I got to a point, I think, I got to a point where I realized that I was spending months talking to people and I wasn't doing what I really wanted to do, which was bring my idea to life. And so I just decided that I was just going to try and start with just working with a UI UX designer and build a prototype. And that was like my first step. And once you have a prototype, you can start talking to potential stakeholders and then take it one day at a time. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, it, I, I never really felt uh, like we couldn't find great technical people. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed knowing a lot of amazing technical leaders who have especially like a systems uh, minded way of solving problems. And I think one of the things that um, I've always tried to kind of do is to work on ideas that I think will will make the world better, will make an impact. And I tend to find that there are, you know, amazing engineers who have oftentimes not been inspired by the work that they do. And to be able to say, look, you know, let's do something transformational. Let's, let's change the world and not, not to, not to even, you know, use that term lightly. Right. Um, and I, I, so far there's just been this cadre of amazing kind of technical leaders who say, wow, I want to, I want to sign up to do something transformational. I can always go get a job somewhere else and I can always ship code, you know, working on maybe in a, in a, you know, something a little bit more scaled, but let's get at the ground level and let's, uh, let's, let's, you know, let's do something that really will make a difference. And I think appealing to that kind of heart 
uh, you know, side of this work is a, is a wonderful way as a non-technical founder to recruit that person to join, to join you in this effort, you know? Before I get to my next question, I would like, hi, Hillary, thank you for joining us. I would like for you to introduce yourself to the audience and tell them a little bit about your startup before we get back into the question. Thank you. I apologize. I, I was a, a audience member for the first five minutes. So, so I had a great time. Um, How do we sound, Hillary? <laughs> yeah, I've been promoted now to be one of you. So I'm very happy. So, um, nice to meet everybody. Uh, glad to be here. I'm a physician and co-founder of Curio, which is a mental health startup. And we are uh, we are designing out a platform to be very much the Peloton of mental health. Um, yeah, and uh, anything else you'd like to hear as my intro or we're all set. That was perfect. That was great. I've loved, I'll, I'll ask some more questions and get more of your expertise through this process. Thank you. Um, Arthur, you brought up a really good point about inspiration and I, I wanna hear from each of you, what was the inspiration behind your startups and was there something that you were noticing in the, like, your industry that you wanted to address? Where does that inspiration come from? Hillary, want to go first since we since we you 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 had to wait the longest. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and so more about the inspiration. So uh, really, you know, and this ties into the whole like uh, starting a company without a technical co-founder bit as well. Um, my experience came from both personal and professional inspirations. I of course see a lot of mental health patients. Um, but also through my recent experience, uh, went through a lot of life challenges, uh, went through a divorce, uh, the pandemic, like everybody else, a couple of close family members who passed away and um, realized along all of that, that what we lack is a, an easy way for people to develop the proper skills to handle big life challenges. So uh, I started Curio, even though I didn't have like a coding technical co-founder, uh, because I felt like it was so urgently a need for everybody and I couldn't uh, wait to do the whole proper vetting of a co-founder. Um, so maybe that answers a little bit of two questions. Great. Sure, I'll go next. I think my I had a horrible experience trying to make a cross-border payment for um, paintings that I had made for me in Ghana, and they were shipped to me in the U.S. And I was trying to make the payment using Western Union, and Western Union did a fraud assessment on me and refused to process the transaction. And that's when I realized that for for me that was genuinely interested in international Africa commerce, there was really a lack of cross-border payments that were just focused on commercial payments. There's a lot of fintechs that are focused on remittances, but people don't think about commerce and the fact that the African continent is importing, exporting goods and services all the time. And we were stuck with very, um, I, I just thought just inadequate, um, solutions. And so when Western Union called me, asked me a bunch of questions, then refused to like process my payments, I basically lost it and said, I really want to solve this problem. It's not, it's just not acceptable for us, for Africans not to be able to engage in cross-border payments like the rest of the world does. Mm. I love that, Avita. I feel like it, it reminds me that, you know, when we have personal stories that speak to the problem that our businesses are trying to solve. It's such a, it's such an authentic way to start a company. And um, it actually gets to how we recruit, you know, technical founders or co-founders because we, you know, we're largely, you know, convicted by our personal stories as a way of also inspiring other people to join us. Right. Um, for me, it was, it was, uh, you know, similar. Uh, I, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I'm in the LGBT community. Um, I grew up, um, you know, as an evangelical Christian and, you know, actually got into entrepreneurship really early because I felt like I was never conforming to kind of a corporate kind of normal job. Um, so entrepreneurship was sort of the way I really realized of like, you know, writing your own rules. If, if you don't want to follow other people's rules as an entrepreneur, you really create your own rules. And um, I got into the HR tech space and was constantly hearing how much, you um, 
heads of talent, heads of HR were struggling to grow diversity in their organizations. And kind of coming from that lens of as a job seeker experiencing homophobia in the hiring process and feeling in many cases, like in my first jobs, I had to cover and not, not you know, really even come out at work because I didn't feel safe. Um, I really felt inspired to, to, you know, build a company that would help address that. And, um, you know, I, 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 we, we really try to bring our personal stories into the mix of every conversation we have introducing what we do at Matheson, just because we feel that our personal identities are so tied to this, this body of work. That's great. Thank you. Um, Avita, you mentioned this before. You first worked with the UI UX designer um, as like the first part of uh, establishing your startup. Um, how did you figure out the right questions to, to ask them when you were going through that process? Well, I think initially, whenever I start working with someone in a, in a space that I don't know much about, I try to read and learn from them first because I know what I, I, I'm trying to get to, but I'm not usually sure about the process and I'm very big on process. So if I'm not very sure on it, I try to learn from them about what are we building? What, why are we using, why are we building this prototype? What can we actually get from it? And so as I learn from them, I actually get a better understanding of what I need from them and then I start tailoring it based on, I need this. Can you help me produce this? And, and I think that's, it's kind of like learn from them and then be, then you kind of get a sense of, okay, now that I have a little bit more knowledge, I can start asking them to help me get to this end point. Yeah, I think personally, I had the same experience when I started working with developers um, I didn't really know the terminology to use when I first started working with them. And it, I'm just like, it's a completely different language because I myself don't know how to code. So um, for all of you, how was it like finding a developer for your, for your platforms, your apps and your projects? I've done a combination of, of strategies. So uh, right now we mainly use the low code tools. And the great thing about the world we live in now is that many developers have created low code tools. So the rest of us can build a pretty full fledged product without needing to actually do coding. Um, and what I've done is contract to a developer or a dev team for short projects. And I found that that tends to work out in terms of cost effectiveness and also managing, uh, you know, it can get very complicated, especially if you're working with a um, offshore team or with multiple different parties who, you know, don't know each other very well. So the best thing that I learned through my years of working on different products with uh, developers uh, is how to very, very explicitly design and plan out and explain to a team like what exactly to build. Awesome. Um, Arthur, did you have any experiences yeah. with developers you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I, I love that, Hillary, because I think that the, the idea of we, we sometimes over overly complicate the, the problems that we're trying to solve, right? So I'm a huge fan of the most lo-fi, inexpensive ways we can validate an idea before we go put code to it. I've definitely made that mistake before of us, you know, going in, get, going underground, building something and then realizing, wait, we, we were off the mark and we spent a lot of money doing that when, when we could have iterated. So we're at, you know, we validated a lot of our early products via WordPress, via Typeform, you know, Google, Google Sheets are amazing. You know, you can, you can do so much to just get lo-fi, you know, things out there uh, in a way that doesn't require code. And, you know, with the advent of some of these amazing new, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of codeless uh, products that are out there, you can, you can really stand up some great MVPs um, in a pretty cheap way. We've also um, blended uh, outsourced um, dev, uh, dev teams and, Today we actually use a blended outsource and uh, and, and in-house team. Um, I think one note as the cautionary tale, it you know it can be a, uh, a you know a good way to 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 quickly stand something up to have an out an outsourced uh, team, but they're never going to care about your product as much as you do. I think that's one thing I definitely learned. So you know we today we use kind of a blended model because we can scale up in certain um, uh, basically functions. 
um, where where we may need to kind of fill in gaps. But we really tried to have to build. You know, we now have a really large in-house dev team, um, and we we find as no surprise they put their tender loving care into the product because it's what they focus on full on, right? Definitely. And I mean, a lot of the experiences that you're all covering on involve a lot of trust. You're entrusting people with your babies, essentially, like you're, you're like the, these companies that you're building. And especially to establish a technical foundation, you're trusting someone with more experience than you with your product. So how do you develop trust with someone who's in the process of working on your MVP and going to launch and through all those phases of these projects? So I'll, I'll take that question. I'll start with that question. Um, I think a part of it is as you're working with them, kind of tracking what they're saying and seeing if they're following through. Um, and, and because as you know, both Arthur and Hillary shared, one is that you don't know the code, the language, like you really don't know. So you're highly dependent on them. But another thing that you have to realize is that for I mean, I use a, a number of different strategies. I've tried trying to get a technical co-founder, realizing that the person wasn't as invested as I was. I tried an agency in Eastern Europe, and then you realize that they're handling multiple clients. And so mm -hmm. your project is as, as important as yours. I've now have kind of gravitated to having a personal, like a um, in in-house team to actually build the product, but yet also depending on technical friends to kind of give me, like just teach me, guide me, know what the right questions are. But one thing I've learned is that trusting your developers has to do with how are they teaching you and are they following through on their promises? And so when they say I'm going to deliver X at this time, is it a high quality product? Are they communicating well? I think that when I've noticed that there are gaps in their stories or they're not following through on things that they've committed to. That's when I, I try to reassess them as, are they truly committed? Are they truly professionals? Are they thinking through the issues and things that I would like them to, the way I would like them to think through it if I was in their shoes? And you kind of pick up those red flags as you work with them. And so you kind of pay attention to them pay attention to their work products, pay attention to how they, they work professionally. And then you start to build trust if they're following through. And then you pick up the red flags and decide that maybe this doesn't work for you and move on to someone else. Yeah. And I would just build on what Avita said by saying that, you know, the, the best way to instill trust is to share ownership. So I think equity and, and being generous with equity, especially with a technical co-founder is important. I think we should always be smart with that by setting people up on a vesting schedule. So in, in, in a lot of cases, I know so many non-technical co-founders who their initial technical co-founder didn't, technical co-founder did not work out and they never assumed this would ever happen, right? It was never in their wildest dreams that that would happen, but they didn't work out. And um, because they hadn't structured equity in a way where there is vesting and, and you're, you know, you're, you're only earning equity for the time that you're actually there, um, it, it became a huge problem. So I think that's one piece. The second is, um, as, as a non-technical co-founder, you know, you're, you're oftentimes going to meet someone who seems amazing and technical. And you know, I think as, as Hillary and Avita mentioned, you, you don't speak the language. And so you're kind of trusting that they know everything. And it's really important to try to meet someone who can be a second or third opinion to vet that person, uh, make sure that they are really able to, to you know, uh, execute and, um, and that they don't have any gaps. Because again, you, we place a lot of trust in an area where we don't have a ton of you know, necessary vernacular. And that can be problematic. Um, I've definitely been burned by, by, by you know, learning a year later that I didn't have the right person um, and finding out from advisors I could have spoken to earlier who could have given me that for, you know, forewarning um, after just minutes of speaking to someone. You know? So try to surround yourself with someone who can be that second opinion or third opinion to just you know, kind of gut check the decision that you're making. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, the second and third opinion is really crucial in any in any organization, whether you're trying to hire, you know, um, like new talent or trying to build a company. It's really great to have another perspective on that. That's not going to be in your shoes, 100 percent. 
And um, you, you've touched on this before about technical co-founders and obviously investments and funding are important parts to startups. And depending on where your process is, you might not be with the same technical co-founder that you were with, or you might not have a technical team that can really speak to VCs and investors from a technical perspective. So how do you navigate those conversations with potential investors? Interestingly for us, it hasn't been a huge issue. I think um, one is we, we do have a product that we were able to test out very well without significant uh, tech development. And so that helps. Uh, second of all, we have a, um, I think, I think uh, based on the current team and our thesis in the market, I think there can be enough conviction without needing to bring on like a technical co-founder. I think it's, it seems obvious that this is a type of company and team where we would hire a CTO or, or contract the developers as needed. Vita, what do you think? Any, anything on this, on this one? I mean, um, I definitely think that that has been held used against me when I was fundraising, because there's always a sense that, well, who's going to build the product, right? Um, and, and one thing I, so a friend actually advised me and said that, well, you do actually have engineers on your team. So maybe include them on your team slide, but don't necessarily have to place them as a technical co-founder because investors are basically trying to de-risk your company, right? So initially I'll try and present myself as just me. I'm the CEO. I'm the I'm the founder, I'm the CEO. Now I try to highlight the entire team and make the engineers, even though they might not be te um, technical co-founders, try and say that, hey, I actually have three engineers on the team. And, and as Hillary said, once you actually start building a product, in the beginning, they might be a little bit hesitant when you don't actually have a product. But once you actually also have a, have a product on the market and you actually have users, then for investors, they think, oh, she's de-risked a little bit. They'll still want to feel like you, you need to have a CTO at some point, but then it becomes less of a liability for them. But definitely in the beginning, that was a lot of, that was quite a challenging question that I got from investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of this comes down to the stage that you're in. So in my experience, when you're in that pre-seed stage, um, it's, it, it, it's not, it doesn't seem like a prerequisite to have a, you know, have a co-founder if you are planning to, to capitalize with kind of venture capital. Um, we found that when reaching that seed stage, we, we did need to have someone in, in, in that role. And then with Series A, it needed to really be someone who was experience in, in scaling a team and had, you know, pretty institutional knowledge um, in, in that technical, you know, technical role. Um, one important note is today, we don't have a technical co-founder. I have, you know, my, my co-founder was on the business side as well. We brought in great technical leadership and product leadership, but, but not in a founder role. And I don't think that is at all a necessity. If you have a strong story um, and, and you can show that you can attract great product and engineering leadership, then, you know, I think that's enough for investors to, to, to see. Did, did any of you, and, and Arthur, I'll start with you. Did you um, have any other mentors or guidance from other people that were also establishing startups to, to learn from them? Did, were they, um, did they seem to be really great mentors for you when you were starting Matheson? Yeah, I have to say, like the best the best advice I've ever gotten in the startup world is to um, is is both to generously mentor when you have that opportunity, but but really to surround yourself with people that have walked this this exciting but challenging path before. Mm -hmm. And um, and and basically, we have I mean, we have a mentor, you know, a formal mentor, an advisor, an equity advisor for every single function of the of the business: sales, marketing, engineering. And, um, and, you know, we, we take mentorship so seriously because we don't, we don't want to ever have to reinvent the wheel. We, we, we'd rather lessen the learning curve as much as possible. And um, we know that, you know, the whole nature of, of running a startup is navigating uncharted territory, you know, so we have to sort of minimize complexity and, 
uh, and, and, and learn from, you know, the past uh, great experiences as much as possible. So I personally seek advice from a ton of people on a regular basis, and we actually formally have built those structures. I'd say, again, this is another area where being generous with advisory equity um, early on um, to, to get folks dedicated to spending time with you to help you navigate this work pays off in dividends. I think there, there oftentimes is this perception, oh, I shouldn't give away, you know, I, I, sh I should be very judicious with, with equity. That's very true. But, um, but if, you can, if you can even just have, you know, small equity, uh, you know, for advisors that, that gets people, uh, you know, in your corner championing you early and giving you advice, it is, it is just, it's just absolutely invaluable. Anyone else have any mentorship or guidance experience, Vita, Hillary? Um, yeah. Oh, go okay, ahead. Go, Vita. No, mm -hmm. go ahead, Hillary. Oh, I was going to say I belong. So I feel like my journey through entrepreneurship has been, you know, much longer than the lifespan of my company um, because you spend so much of it just familiarizing yourself with the world. And, and now I'm at a point where I felt like I've done years of like, really learning unofficial education. And uh, all of that's been through more, e even like peer mentors, I would say, like belonging to communities and, uh, you know, even having those friends. Like now I, I'm lucky to say that like more than half of my friends are founders and some of that's organic. Some of it, um, I belong to like a, a fellowship, like a on deck fellowship um, and you know you keep in touch with other folks and you learn from them because startups are also so rapidly changing that a lot of times you need like really like weak like a week old advice like it just like someone just fundraised last week and then they could tell you something relevant somebody who fundraised last year will not have like updated information so um yeah, your relationships really matter a lot, uh, both for your psychological stability and also for all aspects of your business. Yeah. Um, I agree um, with what Hillary and Arthur said. I think the founder network was most important to me, especially just learning from other people that have recently walked in, <laughs> walked in the, uh, the path that you're trying to navigate. And, and for me, one thing I realized that, you know, building a fintech platform has its own set of challenges. And so even working with fintech founders and even fintech technical, like former fintech CTOs was so huge for us because I, I have now have this fintech um, advisor who, you know, helped us get um, PCI compliant in three weeks. And, you know, if you talk to most people, they take months to do that. But because he had that experience of get, um, going through compliance for a fintech platform, he knew the easiest shortcut. He was like, if you don't do it this way, you can get it done in three weeks with zero dollars spent. And so I just think that finding people especially founders or operators, people who've built companies who have the experience and expertise that you can leverage to learn and build upon, I think is most crucial um, when building your own startup. Yeah. Um, so before we get to the Q and A, cause there's a lot of really valuable questions. I think the audience is asking in the chat. I do wanna ask all of you, if there's something you wish you knew then that you know now, what would that be through, after going through this process? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll start, you know, one, one thing that, that's really, really hard, um, and, I, and I, I, I don't know that there's, I, I don't know you can ever really prevent, prevent this, but um, being generous with hiring more experienced folks earlier on, um, I, I definitely, in, in multiple companies I've started, I've erred on the side early on of, of hiring extremely junior people who we can afford um, and, and, you know, oftentimes waiting to hire more senior people until we've reached a certain stage and to, 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 to basically err on the side of looking at how to bring more experienced folks in earlier. And that's not to say we sh you shouldn't hire, you know, hire, hire folks who you can uh, give amazing oppor opportunities to early on in their career who are hungry and you know that that you need to definitely diversify in that way. But I think um, 
I, you know, we just lucked out and were able to recruit an amazing product executive who had been managing a team of like 500 people. And she came to take like a third salary cut. And she was like, I signed up because I believe in this and I want to, I want to make an impact and I want to work for purpose. And, um, and there are extraordinary people out there who have done amazing things in their careers who actually want to do something exciting and um, startups have that going for them. So I guess think big, yeah, don't, don't like, don't limit yourself in terms of the types of people you can recruit and do it early. Some folks aren't as financially constrained um, and are, are, are willing to work for more equity earlier on and, and get a you know, bigger piece of the pie and, and, and join you earlier. And, you know, again, that can make a huge impact for a business early on. Avila, would you like to share? Sure. I think one thing I, I definitely realized was the importance of mental health. I, I will say that before I became an entrepreneur, I never thought about mental health. Like it was just fine. One thing I noticed, especially for me, was that I, I'm the only kind of founder in my social circle. And so it is very isolating. I also work with a remote team where I am all the way in California. I have a team in on the East Coast, people in Ghana. The, the, I have one person all the way in Kazakhstan, right? And so I didn't, I wasn't prepared for how isolating it could be, right? And so I didn't necessarily have the tools when you start feeling, hmm, my mental health is not as good as it used to be. And so one of the things that I would advise a lot of founders is like, as you're going and you're very exciting, pay attention to your mental health because I think it can really sneak up on you, especially when you haven't really been paying attention to it in the past. I think for, it's so hard. I was going through all the experiences and trying to think like, what would I have wanted to know? And it's hard because I think it all happened the way that it had to. Um, and sometimes when you know things ahead of time, uh, you would have done things differently. Maybe it would have worked out. So I don't have a very satisfying uh, piece of information other than uh, I, I do think, you know, be patient a lot of things in startups there like i i have such a sense of urgency about everything and i want to do it right now i want to make it happen right now um and at the end of the day sometimes you need to await certain timing to line up it might be the market it might be a random event in the universe and uh when it happens you know uh mm -hmm. so you just have to be prepared but sometimes you do have to be patient for things to happen I so want to second that, Hillary, that is so beautifully said. And it's something I struggle with as also the least patient person in the world. And I have to say that we surround ourselves with folks who have created a lot of false senses of urgency in our businesses. And I'm going through this yeah. right now as we're raising money where like, yeah, Forex the business, you've done this the last two years, you need to do it again. And we psych ourselves out with a false sense of urgency. If we get back to the core of like the problem we're trying to solve, sometimes this, you know, hockey stick growth and all these things that do put some sometimes this unnecessary pressure um don't need to be there you know and yeah. so i i just so want to second what hillary just said because it's um this work is really hard to begin with and then to put unnecessary urgency uh and pressure on yourself and your team uh makes it even harder and there are times i i really i really have to work on that personally too you know yeah. I'll just add and say that one of the things that I've learned is ignorance is bliss in this journey. <laughs> I, I feel like if I knew what I was going to experience before I started, I would not have taken this. I would not have done it. I just would not have. And so ignorance is definitely bliss. And I agree with Hillary. Just just take it, learn, grow. And sometimes it really does have to be patient and waiting for the right timing. There's just certain things that are out of your control. I really appreciate you, all of you sharing your experiences, especially as someone that comes from a technical background. It's honestly helping me to empathize with, with like, you know, with biz, business creators to, you know, what, what your experience is like through that. So I, on behalf of our audience, I just want to thank you for sharing those experiences. Um, I do want to um, follow up with a couple of audience questions that came in. Um, someone would love to hear all of your thoughts on 
being a non uh, being a non technical founder in a location that's not necessarily uh, developer rich like Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston. Any any thoughts you could share with people that are trying to establish themselves outside of those areas? Um, I would say that even though you might not be in a um, like in like a startup heavy um, location, I'll say take advantage of the fact that you can create a global community. And mm -hmm. so there's so many resources and groups and communities out there that even though I am based in Silicon Valley, I feel like I don't really even interact with that many people based in the Valley, right? Because you just need to find the people that are interested in what you're building and are willing to help you. And you might realize that those people might not necessarily, that, I mean, as I said, my first set of engineers that I worked in were based in Russia and I found them through Upwork, right? And so just knowing that, you know, you still have a global community, even if you're not in that hot, trendy, sexy area, that mm -hmm. you can still go out and make it happen for you. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, to give you a sense of our geographic spread now as a virtual team, our, our head of product lives in Chicago. We have a, a product manager who's on a farm in Vermont. We have, um, we actually have uh, two team members who are in South America, Argentina and Brazil, who are amazing senior engineers who, you know, we would never have found if we could only search in the Bay Area and in, you know, New York, right, where we had kind of previously had our concentration. So I completely agree with that, you know, take advantage of that amazing virtual collaboration. Um, the good thing with coding also is that as many folks know is, as long as it's getting shipped, and there's some, you know, <laughs> common hour where everyone can connect and do their sprints and their standups, you know, everything else can basically be done uh, somewhat, you know, concurrently. So it's, it's, it's pretty neat in that regard. Um, Avita, someone had a specific question because you brought up working with a team where it ended up not working out. How do you kind of leave those? How do you leave <laughs> those gracefully when things don't really work? That's when you really have to work on your emotional intelligence and try. And I think for, so just being very clear in my case. I knew that I wanted to leave um, the developers had my code. And so I had to make a list of what I needed them to do before I'm like, okay, we're parting ways. And so for example, I wanted us to move their code from their depository into a depository that was on my code. So I would say, I want it moved. And they're like, well, why? And then you can say, oh, well, investors feel more comfortable if it's more under our control. And so basically being very clear about what needs to be done before you sever that relationship and managing their, um, their reactions to it because, you know, people are people and sometimes you never know how people are going to react when they feel like you're rejecting them or moving away from them. And so you have to manage that process and make sure that, you know, you're getting what you need from them without making them feel insulted or upset. And then once you get what you need, you just say, hey, I, for me, as I said, I started with um, an agency in Russia. I hired a couple of engineers. We worked to bring it in. And once I, I told my team, are we good to go? Like if I close this relationship, we're done with them. Once my team was confident that that was the scenario, I was like, listen, you know, it's been a pleasure, but right now going forward, we want to, primarily work with our in-house team, we'll reach out as needed. So I kind of let the door open saying that, hey, let's preserve this relationship in the future. But at the end of the day, I'd moved on and I had gotten what I wanted to make sure that I can move on. And Arthur, you mentioned that you were lucky enough to, to have a really great technical team that you're working with. Um, someone uh, mentioned that they've met a series of technical partners through meetups, demos, job postings. They wanted to know if you had any specific approaches to, to finding a technical co-founder or technical team. Technical team. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, actually we, we, we found uh, our you know, actually our technical leadership uh, by posting a job on LinkedIn <laughs> um, and, and, and actually asking for introductions from some of our existing advisors. And, 
Um, and what was really interesting is um, we just hired this amazing VP of engineering um, who started with us a couple months ago, and he's brought a lot of his previous colleagues with him and they've worked well together. So it's amazing when you open kind of one door, um, you also, you know, meet, meet many other folks who are like-minded. Um, but I would just say that like, you know, sharing the, sharing the vision with people who are close with you and, and to ask, you know, who, who do you know who shares this vision, who, who you think um, really could uh, add, add tremendous value to the team and be motivated by this problem that we're solving. And, um, and that was the, you know, the, the, the way that we really knew that we were, we, we met the right person was, um, you know, Dan Brown, our, our, our VP of engineering just, you know, showed up to the interview, um, sharing his personal story about why the work mattered to him so much. And, um, and, you know, it was kind of like, we can get through anything if, if you're so deeply, you know, moved by what we're doing. It's like, that's, that's everything that propels us, you know? So I think, I think, again, leading with that mission, um, not just, you know, again, all the technical things that we're doing, but really why we're doing it uh, to, to us has always been the, the best way to recruit someone. Um, and when it comes to uh, working with advisors, people wanted to know if there was a specific percentage you would suggest for them. Any numbers flying out there? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I'll just quickly throw out the the two the point two five percent vesting. If you're at a, at a pre seed stage, that's that's considered extremely generous. Um, knowing, of course, that that will be extremely diluted as you continue to grow. Um, I think the, the most important thing that we've learned and we've learned the hard way is important that you establish like a real scope, like, like, a, like contractually feeling scope of what's expected, because there are certainly advisors who will, you know, join and, 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 you know, you'll, you'll get on a great call with them and then you won't see them again and they won't necessarily be proactive in supporting you. So I think be really clear on what your ask is, the number of weekly calls, the, any kind of deliverables, any time that they're investing work that you're going to be doing, because if you're going to be giving someone two, two, you know, point two five percent at an early stage, um, you, you should really think about the economic value of that equity and it should be commensurate with what someone would be doing um, in terms of consulting, right? So you should treat it with that level of, of kind of rigor and, and accountability. Along those lines, I have heard from so many other founders too that they regretted bringing on advisors formally too early. Uh, it sounds like Arthur did a great job like lining up. And I agree, it's very valuable to have truly valuable uh, advisors early on, particularly if they can help you grow the com company like very rapidly in the early stages. The FAST um, form has like some, I think it, it's a, like the founder, um, Founders Institute, I think they have like a FAST form. It's like the advisor uh, deal and they have pretty standard like amount of time level of expertise to the amount of equity. So I've seen that uh, used quite frequently. Um, but other than that, I would say the, the folks who I would bring on as like equity advisors and I thus far haven't uh, would be, you know, people who are so game changing that they would like, you know, elevate your startup to a whole new tier or two, um, you know, folks who offer to help just organically and are actually helping you like from without any equity uh, discussion early on. And then you want to like help reward them or continue the work with them. Um, we have another question that came in. Um, so as founders, have you found it difficult at all to tap into a diverse talent pool? It's the nature of what we do as a software <laughs> in terms of diversity recruiting. So it's been a major part of, it's like the lens through which we look at every kind of recruitment. I think one thing to note, and this is what we tell employers is, um, if we want to cast a wider net, we should really think um, unconventionally about people's skills and experiences. So founder even, it isn't necessarily the case that every single person has, you know, gone to Stanford for their engineering degree. Um, and, you know, it might be that someone got their start by going to a, boot, a coding boot camp and has been teaching themselves how to code and is now in a really great place to 
you know, you know, after years and years of doing that and maybe being in a, in a junior role somewhere is ready to kind of take the next leap. So I just, I think just, you know, be sure to think unconventionally about those qualifications and, and minimum criteria, because um, we definitely, you know, lessen the pool if we, if we restrict, uh, you know, sort of how we're thinking about, you know, what success looks like. Um, Avita, you had mentioned um, working with um, someone from Upwork. Um, any other resources? All of you can answer this. Any sources of information that you would recommend for other potential founders um, when they're building their first MVP, Upwork, Fiverr, anything like that? Um, I really like Upwork in terms of finding technical contractors for short, like short projects and if I work really well with them I continue working with them a little bit longer um, I generally feel that you know um, author made a comment about diverse you know trying to tap into diverse pool and I will say that I look at my team and I think we can definitely do a better job um, I generally try to rely on referrals when it comes to like trying to get to people. Because I think that when you're a startup, you're really looking for people who are truly committed and truly professional, right? Not people who are just gonna talk a good game and not show up because you're already starting off in a very, very fragile position, right? <laughs> and so you, you just really need people who are just going to be there in the trenches with you. And so I generally tend to rely on, like, as I said, my founder network in terms of tools that they're using. So I've used 99 designs um, for like, when it comes to design work, I've used Upwork a lot for contractors. Um, I don't, I love um, the podcast, how I built it. And mm -hmm. I think it goes back to something that Arthur mentioned about, there's the sense of that hockey stick and the way startups should be built. And one thing that I love about how I built it is that you hear all of these diverse stories of how people built their companies, highly successful companies in different industries at different times. And it gives you a sense of confidence that, hey, you might not have what people think is a traditional, like, path to like a successful startup, but you could still build a very successful company. And so when I think off the top of my head, those are the ones that I think of. I don't really do a lot of books, but I think sometimes it depends on just being careful about who you're getting advice from. And because remember that it's from their perspective. And so for me, when I think about it being an African Black woman focused on something that is primarily focus on the African space. Yeah, there's a lot of advice, but I'm not sure how well it might be relevant to me and what I'm building. So you kind of pick where you're getting information from. And then, you know, and I think at the end of the day, life, the experience is the biggest um, way to learn, to be honest with you. Your experiences are the, the most effective way to learn. Anything to add, Hillary, Arthur? I think that was really well said. I, 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 I think Avita sums it up beautifully. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate all of you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, that includes our session. I wanna also thank Startout for putting this event together. Um, I believe there is a break right now, but until the next session starts, so everyone can find the next session they're attending in the Philo, um, in the Philo uh, community. So thank you again for everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, take care. Thank you everybody. Thanks everyone, this was great. Great, mm -hmm. great facilitating Jules. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>